Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to Pelgrain Press's investigative masterclass, uh, where we're going to uh, share tips and tricks and uh, structures for running uh, mysteries and investigations in tabletop role playing. Uh, let me begin by introducing our panelists. Uh, we have the creator of The Fall of Delta Green, Knights Black Agents, Trail of Cthulhu, and The Day After Ragnarok, my podcasting partner in crime, Kenneth Haidt. We have the co-owner and managing, managing director of Pelgrane Press, the producer of such gumshoe products as the Yellow King role-playing game, Swords of the Serpentine, and Fall of Delta Green, the least mean person in gaming, Kat Tobin. Hello! Uh, we have the prolific master of real-time research, known for such game products as Cthulhu City, Eyes of the Stone Thief, and The Difficult Half of the Dracula Dossier, author of the novels The Gutter Prayer and The Shadow Saint, The Gaelic Manch, Gareth Ryder Hanrahan. Hello. And I'm Robin D. Laws. Uh, I'm the designer of the Gumshoe Core System, uh, which is Pelgrane's uh, mystery and investigation uh, rule set, which is expressed in many different games uh, designed by different people. Uh, the one I've uh, designed include the Esoterra Sphere itself, uh, and most recently, the Yellow King role-playing game. I am Robin D. Laws. Um, so I thought I would begin uh, by just uh, doing a round uh, robin of quick hits from around the panel for your uh, number one uh, tip for uh, running uh, mysteries and investigations as distinct from uh, the uh, more overtly action adventure style games that are still uh, sort of the, the number one uh, uh, structure that we use in tabletop uh, role-playing gaming. And I'll, I'll throw this uh, uh, to Gar for uh, starters. I mean, the, the obvious number one tip is to use the gumshoe system, <laughs> but in a slightly less mercenary way, just be aware that mysteries are about information management. You need to know what clues the players picked up on, what clues they missed, what clues they need to find, and basically make sure they have the information they need to progress in the mystery. They're not either stuck because they haven't found a clue yet that are pixel which to find it, or they've found a piece of information but haven't realized that it's like, you know, the thing they need to do next to, to progress the mystery. Because we, it's not as, as clear as like, you know, you go down the corridor, I kick up the next door. They need to know what, where they can go and what they should be doing. Uh, so Kat, what's your uh, number one tip? So I think that, um, continuing on from what Gareth's just said, um, the number one tip that I would have is to talk to your players, like establish communication with your players, make sure that they know they're in an investigative adventure, make sure that they are interested in and ready to solve a mystery over the course of the game, that they're not just looking to kick down doors and shoot dragons or whatever. Um, and also talk to them at the table as well. So, um, for example, if they get if they do get stuck in the mystery, like talk them through a recap of what they already know. Like do come in and tell them that, you know, they said that they were going to go and talk to this person or they had earlier talked about, you know, investigating this thing. So remind them of the pieces of information that they might have forgotten about that will help them to solve the mystery. And also um, something we do in Gumshoe is that we give our GMs um, what's called an investigative ability um, master list. So the GM knows all the investigative abilities that each of the player characters has. And as a result, they, you, can, you can use that to deliver pieces of information. So I think it, it's very important for the GM to, to feel comfortable with giving players information, reminding them about information that they need to continue on their way. Like it's not, you're not competing with your players, you're working together to solve the mystery. I can. I think that the most useful thing that you can do as the GM of a mystery adventure is have in your head a as clear and detailed an idea of the the crime, the thing that they're trying to solve as you can. And that does not need to include who committed it, although that's helpful. You need, but you need to know, for example, if they're in the parlor and you think, oh, the thief broke in the windows, rifled through the china cabinet, and then was surprised in the parlor by the victim, 
You need to know, oh, if they go to the windows, they'll see a, a sign of forced entry. If they go to the, you know, China cabinet, they'll see that um, uh, the, the plates are out of order. Um, if they, you know, whatever it is, so that you can feed them those clues fairly organically without uh, inviting them to have to examine every single aspect of the room, because that encourages slow, tedious investigative play in which you're literally playing every inch of Sherlock Holmes crawling along the carpet, as opposed to saying, um, uh, with your keen eye, you can see that there's a tiny shard of China lying in the Obasan carpet as though it's been uh, inadvertently kicked there, possibly during a struggle. And then you've delivered that information, you've delivered it in an empowering way, and you've delivered it in a way that does not take 10, 15 minutes of them saying, no, but I look out of the Obasan, not the Bokhara, uh, over and over again, so that you can actually uh, feed that information, as, as Kat says, and get the players uh, moving in the direction that will hopefully lead them to the who and the why, as opposed to simply the where and the was it near a China cabinet. I guess that's the other classic question in all mysteries. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would say that uh, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, GMs are often worried about the adventure and the mystery being too easy, uh, whereas, uh, in fact, the, just the process of being a player in a game where you're looking at a whole bunch of different possibilities for what can be going on, you often spit ball theories with the other players, is that players will tend to complicate the mystery already without your having to do a ton of stuff in order to make it seem puzzling to them. But just the experience of playing a mystery game is inherently puzzling. And then often your task, as Kat uh, described, is to uh, sort of help them, not lead them along, uh, but to maintain their orientation and to uh, remember uh, often uh, the players will run through all of the possibilities that could be going on and immediately dismiss the thing that you've designed into the adventure as what is actually going on. And so sometimes you have to kind of uh, nudge people uh, back and you are rarely actually forcing them back on track. You're helping them to find uh, their uh, orientation within uh, the storyline. Um, for the benefit of people who are not familiar with the gumshoe system, uh, the reason that Gar said use gumshoe is that uh, the core of, of all the different gumshoe games is the idea that it is never interesting to fail to get information. And so uh, you never have to roll to get a clue in gumshoe, but rather you just have to do what you would in other systems where you have informational skills, where you use the skill, you ask the GM, what do I know uh, with my streetwise ability? Um, and, uh, and then you are given the, the information uh, and uh, there's just no role in it. And that, what that does is it not only streamlines play, it avoids the 20 minute thing where you uh, lose track of, uh, uh, you, you know, you, you fail your role and then you have to spend 20 minutes uh, the jam trying to figure out how to get you back uh, on track and then find some other way to do that. And they hope you roll successfully then or there's another 20 minutes of faffing around. Uh, Gumshoe just skips that 20 minute failure hunk and then replaces it with a richer in mystery that is more about uh, now once you have a lot of information, what does that mean? Uh, which is more about uh, more like what standard investigations uh, are like in the real world where there's uh, too much information and you're trying to narrow things down. Um, so uh, for the rest of this masterclass format, uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna cover some basics of uh, investigative uh, uh, gaming uh, in order to help you sharpen up your uh, skills running uh, games. And then uh, we are going to uh, answer questions, uh, pose the questions uh, in the Twitch chat, and then through a, a magical process, uh, those questions will be transmitted to us and we will uh, answer them. Um, so the first part about running a successful investigative uh, campaign is or game is to uh, craft the scenario. Uh, you can obviously start with a published scenario that uh, skips a big part of that. Uh, at uh, Pelgrane, uh, we've got a lot of different scenarios for uh, different uh, systems, but uh, Kat, I thought you could uh, uh, kick us off with what makes a really great investigative uh, scenario sing. Um, 
Yeah, so I think um, obviously a compelling mystery is kind of the 101 of it. Um, but a thing that I've, I've heard, I think, Ken saying before in the past is that you have to think, or maybe it was you, Rob, I'm not sure, but you have to think about it from two directions. So you kind of work out your starting point and your end point, and then you make sure that you can kind of design it in two directions to get from point A to point B. Um, and I think that as well, like I'm always really interested in investigative mysteries that are more, um, they're almost diamond shaped. So they start off from a particular point and then they expand out. So there are a lot of different branches or avenues that the players can take. Um, but then as they start to eliminate different, um, different avenues or as they start to rule out uh, particular people as being the the culprits or whatever they start to narrow back in again towards a conclusion so I think that giving players a lot of options to start off with but then allowing them to eliminate those options to get to um, a resolution and to get to an end point is is for me a, a really strong investigative mystery structure uh, so at uh, Pell Green when we're uh, uh, publishing scenarios we have sort of two uh, structures. Uh, one that I uh, tend to favor called the maze of clues, one that Ken tends to favor, which we'll get to in a bit. Uh, but Gar, uh, can you sort of explain, since you've done this uh, uh, many times, perhaps even more than I have, how you go about uh, structuring and creating uh, a scenario in the maze of clues style and, and what that structure is? Basically, um, <clears throat> the core of the gumption system is that you always put the information and one type of information you always find is a clue that leads you on to the next scene. Uh, so basically, you like you know the classic one is like the detective finds the matchbox with the name of our bar written on it. He goes to that bar on the next scene. Um, a good a good scenario, as Kat described, will have branches, so you have like you know, multiple possible leads from each scene, and you'd also have a bunch of clues that don't necessarily point immediately to the next scene, but will give you information of what's going on. They'll foreshadow stuff that's coming later. They'll help you work out the like overall mystery, what's going on, or help you succeed in the final scene against the final bad guy. So really, what's the next step then is from your like you know, starting scene, you map out uh, <clears throat> how the investigation will progress, um, see, clue, see leads along the way to connect up all those scenes, and scatter clues about what's really going on. Um, so it has a scene focus that this yeah. uh, uh, structure uh, will write out particular scenes and things that happen in those scenes as a way to sort of do a lot of the uh, basic storytelling work up front for the uh, GM. And the GM can then go, if the players decide to go in another direction, um, you can uh, uh, in improvise to whatever extent you want. But it gives you that baseline uh set of things that will probably happen or many of them will probably happen in the course of the scenario when uh, the GM actually runs it. Uh, and Ken, uh, you uh, favor the ocean of clues. How do you go about writing an ocean of clues scenario? Uh, the ocean of clues is, is uh, such that when the players figure out or are presented with the situation, they move through a uh, milieu, whether it be a big country house or in my favorite methodology, uh, something like the, you know, uh, the, the, the wretched hive of scum and villainy, uh, Vienna 1948, you are there, that kind of thing. And in each sort of uh, milieu, whether that be uh, high society and the docks or whether it be the circle around St. Germain and uh, the uh, the police station or whatever, there is a bunch of different potential clues, all of them pointing like little magnetic iron filings toward the solution. And as you move through those milieus organically by, you know, getting mad at one uh, lady and uh, being put onto another person by a third person, and you get your understanding of the people involved, the personalities and the and the sort of social forces or political forces or magical forces, if you're in that kind of world, eventually clues accrete to each other and you move from milieu to milieu as though you're sort of flowing through an ocean of, of clues feeding on the delicious informational krill therein. And when you have uh, uh, enough information to eliminate all of the suspects, 
uh, or all the suspects at one, you can hone in on the culprit and uh, seize them in their, beard them in their den or, or confront them in the, you know, uh, Palace of Justice or whatever it is that, that, the, that the final confrontation is going to be. And that's going to be dictated more by the culprit than by anything else, because you're going to be going after them at, at a given place unless you've got the ability Nero Wolf style to make them all come sit in your living room and have you lecture them, which is not something most uh, investigative uh, uh, role playing characters have, sadly. Um, and uh, another thing about an investigative scenario is that the uh, forces who you are trying to investigate, or perhaps just secondary characters who you annoy along the way, will react to that and push back. Uh, and that creates uh, a structure we call the antagonist reaction. And so this enables the GM to, when the players are starting to get a little distracted and bogged down, or uh, they have not had sufficient hazard for a while, that you can then choose to have uh, something happen to them. Uh, and if you think back to your favorite detective uh, movies or novels, right, it's a, a, a trope of the structure that, you know, sometime a guy's gonna come through the door with a gun and uh, this enables you to uh, create uh, sort of excitement. And it also uh, is something that you can make optional uh, so that uh, the uh, idea often in a fantasy game is, well, there's a series of fights and there's the big boss fight at the end and without that, you haven't had a good time. But in an investigative game, if the players are really leaning into uh, the solution to the mystery, they, may in fact uh, not require uh, any uh, physical confrontation or adventure genre stuff at all. But it's always good to find a way to uh, create uh, tension and, and urgency uh, and, uh, and stakes. Um, so when we're looking at designing scenarios, uh, can, uh, the, uh, often the, a great idea to, to begin with is to think of what seems to be going on and then underneath of that, what is really going on? And that is often enough of a twist uh, to uh, devise that. Uh, so uh, I'm also gonna call on the group for sort of a round of more advanced scenario uh, creation uh, tips. What is something, uh, a, a mistake that you try to avoid or, or that you see other writers making that you have to correct when you are developing uh, gumshoe adventures, Kat? Um, so a thing that I see quite often is, um, so, so gumshoe adventures, and I think most investigative mystery adventures are structured in terms of clues. And um, an issue that I see sometimes with um, people designing gumshoe, gumshoe adventures for the first time is um, effectively gluing clues into particular locations or attaching them to particular um, non-player characters. Um, so is something that I always recommend to people to do, and it's something that I, I try and do when I'm developing adventures, is to make sure that there are multiple ways that the players can get, you know, really vital clues. And we have things called core clues, which are pieces of information that you absolutely have to get to solve the mystery. So if something is a core clue, it should be available in multiple different ways. It shouldn't just depend on the players having to go to this one person and talk to this person. If it's a really important if it's really important to solving the mystery, the GM should have the flexibility that if the players decide that they don't want to go and talk to that NPC, they actually want to go over here and um, you know force you to improvise a whole other village of NPCs that you hadn't even thought about, that you can take that clue that was originally, that you had originally decided would be with this NPC over here and just very easily move it give it to another NPC, or you can move it from one location to another, or you can put the book that the information is in, in somebody's house, as opposed to the library you were sure that the players would want to go to, because there's one thing guaranteed in life is that players will never do what you expect them to do. So having multiple ways of getting at that information and being able, you know, giving your, giving the person GMing the game um, a way of course correcting when the players kind of go in a direction that nobody's anticipated, I think is super important. Uh, so Ken, what's a thing that you would build into a scenario to avoid uh, what would otherwise be a, a common problem? I mean, it's uh, in, in terms of building stuff into the scenario, it's more just a matter of, 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 of like Kat says, understanding that players will make their own complications. I, I think that uh, something that, um, uh, that you said uh, early on, or the cat I believe said early on, is that um, when you're in the mystery, you've got so much 
going on as a player in a role-playing game that everything seems more complex than it is. And what you, the GM or the scenario designer, think is a ridiculously easy clue. First of all, they may never get you know to that NPC or they may never do something else. Um, so you should have multiple ways to find out any truly important thing. Uh, uh, you know, where, where the entry took place, did they have to have magic to do the crime? Some way that you can eliminate a bunch of suspects, that kind of information there should be multiple arrows onto, which means conversely that you don't need to put red herrings into the scenario because players are their own red herrings. They, they will confuse and, and mess with their own trail more than enough. Uh, and, and we, uh, mistakenly believe that in mystery novels and some movies uh, and all episodes of uh, Law and Order that there has to be a red herring or else it's not a successful convincing mystery. That is a way of, um, uh, of, of delaying the trip for a unitary observer under the control of the writer uh, to the end. Uh, in a world where you have multiple observers under nobody's control, Delay is baked right into that pie. So you don't need to add more things that will make it harder to solve the mystery. So it seems sort of counterintuitive that the best way to make a, 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 a satisfyingly complex mystery is to stop making it complex and just layer on details that all point to the same thing. Uh, Gar, what's a uh, way uh, that you would propose of uh, uh, circumventing a common mystery scenario or scenario error? Um. One thing I'll do is basically think like a player as opposed to think like an investigator. Um, like a detective in a TV show might have like you know, see a like, you know, mysterious figure in the distance, uh, chase around the corner, and the figure's gone. Dun dun dun. The detective goes, "Well, that was mysterious." Onto the next scene. Players will like instantaneously set up a dragnet. They'll s- spread out. They'll surround the area. They will. They will be far more dogged about chasing down NPCs. They will like do their best to follow people. It's a lot harder to do ambiguous foreshadowing because players are just so determined to interrogate people or chase up information. So what you need to do is be careful that the players can't short circuit the mystery. Like you know, if you have an assassin, make sure that he has like you know a suicide pit or something in his tooth, because otherwise they will like you know interrogate him instead of going up and let him go. And uh, my tip on that front uh, would be uh, to avoid uh, antagonists whose uh, motivations are uh, irrational or impossible to figure out. Because ideally, uh, just as in a fantasy game, uh, the ideal is to have a big fight at the end that nearly kills uh, at least half the party, but doesn't. Uh, that uh, a, the, your narrative goal in an investigative game is to have them almost piece together everything about the mystery until the final scene, and then they find one more thing that puts it all together. But if you have a, uh, a, a bad guy whose scheme is just, well, he's lost all touch with reality, or he's completely mistaken about why, uh, you, you, you know, he's pursuing vengeance against this person, but that doesn't actually make sense because uh, it's actually somebody else who did it, and he's been fooled. Um, and so if you're going to do something where the there's certainly lots of examples in the real world where uh, criminals are uh, behaving irrationally. Uh, there's also lots of uh, 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 fictional antagonists who've lost touch with reality. But if that's going to be a part of your uh, scenario, you have to have the players dis- discover that pretty early on and ha- then have to factor that into what they're doing so that they, they know in scene two that uh, this person is wrongly pursuing the completely uh, innocent person for vengeance. And then from that point, the question then is, well, how do we uh, put this person's trail together and find them rather than who is it or what what it is that they're doing? Because the players need to be able to come up with a logical theory of the case in order to then go on and uh, understand what's going on. And if they get to the final scene and just, why'd you do all those things? Well, well I was misinformed. Uh, that's a giant uh, annoying anticlimax and something they couldn't have possibly been expected to uh, figure out. Um, so that moves us uh, from uh, scenario construction and we can get back into that a little later if there are questions. Uh, but then there are the issues of uh, guiding players to behave like investigators because 
it is uh, occasionally the case that you will be running for an insurance investigator or a private eye or uh, someone like that, uh, but or uh, but uh, you know, or or an archaeologist who uh, travels the world uh, saving artifacts uh, with his whip and his pistol. Chances are you're not, um, and so you have to sort of help people to think uh, like investigators. Uh, Ken, what is one way to uh, uh, to to tell them basically? You're a seasoned investigator, therefore you would do X now that you're stumped. I mean, in, in a way, that's why skills like um, uh, 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 tradecraft exist in Knights Black Agents, or why skills like um, uh, uh, assess honesty exist in uh, uh, virtually all the games or bullshit detector, is that you don't have to uh, answer questions and let them do the deduction, you can answer the questions with the deduction that a seasoned investigator would make. And so by presenting things in that way, um, you can say, um, this was clearly a brush pass by uh, uh, someone who's working for the bad guy and uh, working for the Russians. And then Having presented that, you've closed off a million other opportunities that players left for themselves. They, they'd start interrogating the guy at the grocery store endlessly. And it's like the grocery store guy's just a just a tool, just a plant. You know that. You're seasoned CIA guys. Uh, you, you need to be following the guy who made the brush pass and was, has been gone for, you know, an hour. And that, uh, that, that the existence of that ability lets you feed the skill, you know, sort of with, an, with a spin or a magnetic polarization – that points them towards investigative behavior as opposed to just sort of randomness um, uh, and thrashing around. Um, you can also, you know, uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of of drowning the players in information that is based on their own amazingness. You know, when, when Sherlock Holmes comes up and he says, oh, this is clearly um, a, a kind of cigar ash that is smoked only by people who've recently returned from Malaysia. That's an amazing scene when Sherlock Holmes does it. Why not let the player have it and say, you know, as, as someone who's made something of a study of cigar ash, you know that this is only um, uh, uh, cigar smoked in uh, Malaysian rubber plantations and not in Europe anywhere. It can't even be bought in London. So it must have been someone who's just come back from Malaysia. And then uh, by presenting that in the you're so smart, you know, this uh, terminology, they have uh, that that shared moment of Sherlock Holmesness and they're not wasting your time tracking down tobacconists. Uh, and that's right. You, it's useful to have a rule set that assumes that the characters are actually expert in the investigative abilities that they're using, uh, rather than having 30% in library use or something. So uh, uh, so in Gumshoe, uh, sometimes the players will say to me, uh, well, we need to find somebody to talk to, and, and we need to find a scientist who can explain this to us. And then I will say, to the character with the science ability, you are the best scientist you know. So what is it that you wanna find out about uh, this uh, uh, document or this painting or this uh, sample? Because you're gonna figure it out, just ask me the right uh, question. Uh, uh, Kat, you were talking earlier about uh, guiding the players and helping them out uh, beyond uh, reminding them and giving them recaps. How do you uh, guide people in play when they start to get stumped? Um, yeah, I think I think absolutely what Ken has said is realize that the the PCs are experts at what they do. You know, the the characters have skills, they have talents, they have abilities, and give the players their spotlight time with those with those skills and abilities. Um, yeah, so I, I think that I think that kind of using that and not being afraid as well. I think that we come out of, of quite a confrontational. Um, gaming culture um like the earliest games were very much um gm versus players and i think that we need to to move much more towards that that collaborative uh, play culture that i was talking about earlier where the gm is on the same side right you are there to help them it is no fun for anyone if they get stuck right so if they get completely stuck just you know say how about you go and talk to this person as a seasoned investigator, as Ken said, you would know that this person is is the is the best way to find out more about um, obscure cigar smoking people. Um, so yeah, like use that. It, like the it's frustrating for players when they get stuck, but it's also frustrating when 
you as a GM have all of the story and you're like, you know, drip feeding it to them like when you feel like it because you are the special king, right? The players are the people who should have the spotlight. They are the ones who should be doing all the cool stuff, who should have all the cool moves, who should know all the cool stuff. So so just give them, don't never be afraid to give them the information like in whatever format they need it in. If you've hinted at things and they haven't picked them up, then just tell them out straight. Uh, so Gar, you've run investigative games for uh, many, many years at, at conventions and played with a lot of different people. Are there typical ways that players get stuck uh, that you can recommend uh, for GMs to uh, be prepared for and, and how do they act on that preparedness by getting them unstuck? Um, players get stuck by having dismissed a clue they found as being irrelevant. Um, they, they, find, they, they find some like you know, piece of evidence and one of the players goes, oh, look, I found a clue. And another player goes, aha, no, I worked, that's a red herring or something. We can ignore that. And then they run off on some other random tangent. Um, they can get stuck by basically getting into these loops where they try and solve the mystery by just talking to each other and like, speculating endlessly about what these clues might mean as opposed to going out and finding more information um, where you basically throw dice at them and start moving again or have something happen or just even say, lads, you, 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 you chew through every possible um, interpretation. Nothing fits. There's more information to be found. Go ahead and look for it. Um, Another thing I found occasionally is that players will will focus on solving the mystery without working out like you know, or they work out, uh, or work out what happened without thinking about what their action should be. Like you know, they will identify who the murderer is without any plan to bring the murderer to justice or um, like you know, thwart the Cthulhu cult or whatever. They just focus on like solving the puzzle as opposed to solving the whole scenario. Um, other ways that players uh, can get into trouble. Uh, one is that uh, players will often be, uh, would rather investigate documents or in a contemporary game, somebody's computer hard drive, or they'd rather sneak into someone's apartment when they're not there to look for clues than to actually go to the trouble of talking to people. Um, and so uh, any uh, investigative scenario worth its salt has interactions with, uh, with NPCs or GMCs as we call them uh, in Gumshoe. Uh, and uh, you will sometimes have to nudge them, well, somebody's you know, gonna have to go talk uh, to the uh, guy at the old mill. You know, I, I, he does have a hook for a hand, we've established that, and that does make him uh, 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 somewhat uh, uh, troubling, but you know, he probably comes by that honestly, and maybe he's not as frightening as, as you think he is, or maybe you'd better go uh, talk to him. Um, and uh, another uh, issue that will often come up is that uh, the uh, players will uh, decide to go undercover with a cover story that then prevents them from asking the questions that they need to ask of the characters. And they sort of will be too clever by half. And then they have to start worrying about keeping their cover story valid when if they just went in with a more honest approach of who they uh, are, they would then be able to uh, ask the, the questions. Um, so uh, I think it's time to look at uh, the uh, stock of questions we have here. We have a lot of them. Uh, so uh, the first question is, do you have any tips on running an investigation during a, a dungeon crawl beyond uh, what is the monster in the next room? Uh, Gar, you've done some work on uh, fantasy uh, investigation. Uh, how do you make uh, uh, that work in that genre? Yeah, I mean, a dungeon crawl is just like you know, another venue for a mystery. Like, um, you could basically have the entire dungeon be the investigation. Like, you know, you're going to work out, like, you know, this was an ancient temple to some god. There is a, like, you know, ritual to, uh, to uh, please the god that will give you access to the central treasure chamber. So you've got to basically travel through the dungeon, fighting guardian monsters, examining ancient carvings on the walls, conjuring up the ghosts of priests and interrogating them. And um, working out like you know how this like ancient religion worked, and then discovering that like you know one of the uh, <coughs> ghostly priests is actually a traitor who's trying to get you to open the church chamber so you can find the resurrection spell inside and end the world and so forth. I mean, you you, you can find clues and have puzzles to solve anywhere. Um, 
and a dungeon while it's full of like you know perils and so forth is all constantly full of information. Uh, and of course, there are other environments in a fantasy world that uh, allow you a more traditional uh, mystery, a city where you can talk to uh, various uh, weird characters that are engaged in crime. Uh, but the mystery doesn't have to be like the mysteries in uh, police procedurals or uh, hardboiled detectives. It can be about fantasy-like things. So uh, there's there's no there's only one way to kill this particular monster that's uh, rampaging across the countryside, and I have to find what that is, or there's only uh, one sword that will kill him and I need to locate where the sword is, or uh, suddenly uh, all of the uh, members of the priesthood have vanished uh, in the middle of uh, conducting a, a ritual. Uh, it turns out when you look into it that they did that on purpose. What are they doing and what are they up to? And uh, is it good or bad? And why is this other group uh, trying to uh, stop them? Uh, our next question is, uh, uh, I think we kind of uh, covered the whole question of uh, uh, how we present information to people as if they are experts. Um, so just to briefly reiterate, uh, you uh, describe them uh, as, as experts and make it as cool as they can and tell them, maybe add a little detail as, yeah, while you were in Cairo, uh, you talked to a professor and you talked your ear off about this whole uh, resonance pattern and that's why, why you know about it. Uh, the next question is, is it good to provide deduction prompts uh, like uh, in your example of possibly during a struggle or to try and let the players uh, deduce that themselves. So the, the question here is, uh, how uh, far do you go in doing the solving for the players, Ken? Um, I think that that is really going to come down to reading your table and knowing your players. And I think at the beginning, before they've really got the hang of playing in investigative adventures, uh, it's good to just sort of feed them as much as they need uh, to move forward. And I don't think that they have a problem with that. And then as they get better at using those deductive muscles, you can start just providing naked facts and letting them deduce things. But again, the problem is always going to be that uh, they're going to complicate matters. So providing more detail uh, of information helps you simplify. So I would, I would lean on that until you have solid experiential proof that your players are getting too good at deducing. And believe me, that'll take longer than you think it's going to. Uh, Jeff Cars asks, uh, what are your feelings on going with a player solution that matches the clues, but uh, isn't your answer? Uh, and basically I think that's a matter of the player uh, GM contract. A lot of players traditionally want to feel that they are solving a puzzle and feel cheated if they then realize that you just uh, gave them the answer that they uh, were uh, led toward. Um, but uh, another group will go, well, we wanted narrative control and we wanted this to be true. Why did you go back to your other stupid answer? So I, the answer to that is subjective and, and depends on your group. Uh, the next question is, do you use some kind of flow chart to help design a mystery? Uh, have you ever had any luck building a mystery spontaneously? Let's start with the first of those questions. Kat, how do you feel about uh, using flowcharts and and uh, and diagrams of mysteries? Um, yeah, so the reason that I'm laughing is that this is a, a bit of an in joke um, because I love I love flowcharts. I absolutely love flowcharts for designing mysteries. I think they're one of the. Um, I'm not usually very graphically minded, I'm more text minded, but I find them a really good way of visualizing the flow of information through a mystery. So I think that if you can write down, and we in Gumshoe Games tend to structure, um, we tend to structure the game in terms of scenes. So what we'll do is we'll um, essentially map out all of the different scenes and what information, what clues are available in each of those scenes. And then we'll, we'll present that as a flowchart as a flowchart to the GM, um, which we called a scene flow diagram. And that just allows the GM to kind of see, it's it's really important, I think, in pacing the game. So you know kind of how far through the mystery the players actually are. Um, and it also allows you to control the flow of information better. Like if you've been playing for a session and you're still, you know, you've still only moved on one scene, then you know maybe you need to be, um, you know, we were talking about how much you feed the players um, the information versus let them deduce things. And I think that you can definitely get a sense from looking at the overall structure 
of the mystery, where they are in the mystery, how much progress they've made, and whether you maybe need to be a bit more deliberate and a bit more explicit with clues. So I am a big fan of um, of using what we call scene flow diagrams to, to map out each of our mysteries. Um, if you're designing a scenario for yourself and you are very skilled at creating a flow chart that you can later on understand yourself, uh, it is an invaluable resource. Um, I sometimes worry a little though that uh, for published adventures, the more choices that an adventure has, the bigger mess the flow chart then appears to be. Um, and so uh, I'm uh, sometimes worried that it makes it seem too daunting because it's just, you could go anywhere from any other scene to any other scene. Well, that's actually the ideal design, right? Uh, but the solution to that is just get a really brilliant graphic designer like uh, Christian Knudsen, and, and then he will fix it for you. Uh, next, oh, oh, so there's the second question uh, from the same asker, uh, which is, have you had any luck building a mystery spontaneously? Uh, Ken, how spontaneous are the mysteries that you uh, run uh, for your players? Um, I'm generally a very uh, spontaneous GM, but if I'm running a mystery, I, as I said at the top of the, uh, of the panel, I always try to have a pretty, you know, uh, close to uh, a crystalline 3D knowledge of what the solution is, who the culprit is ideally, although sometimes I'll leave that open uh, for, to, for, because my players enjoy making reality happen like Jeff uh, was asking. So sometimes I'll say, whoever the person was, they did this magic thing, they created this set of circumstances, they went through this window, they did this to uh, the victim. And then the players, uh, as they move towards that, I will improve because they will be using their investigative abilities. And I will say, okay, knowing what I know exactly about the mystery, is it legitimate that that action would have left a clue that that ability can find? And the answer is usually yes, because no one is perfect. And if you are fighting an invisible teleporter, who's a total stranger, shows up and stabs the guy and then teleports away to Germany again, well, that's not a mystery. That's just an annoyance. That's a blink dog. So um, uh, generally, there there will be some uh, trail left, some trace, and I will allow the players to pick up on it. But I won't necessarily have um, uh, have flow charted out how my players will go because in my personal table experience, a flow chart lasts about three boxes before they tear off the edge of the paper and onto a whole different table. Sometimes, so uh, I, I maintain a. a very strong understanding of the center of the mystery, and I let them sort of figure out their own uh, labyrinthine way towards it. Um, one thing I'd add on doing mystery spontaneously is I found there's a huge difference between doing a one shot as a spontaneous mystery and a campaign in sort of spontaneous form. Like I can improvise a, sorry, a one shot mystery and it'll make sense to both players and GM on the fly. What I found though is if I like run mystery one session, we stop. And unless I've taken very, very detailed notes on what my thought processes were in the middle of the game, we'll come back next week and have a vague idea what's going on. And the players will go, right, what about the yellow flowers? And I'll go, I have no idea. I know that you know, I had something for the yellow flowers. They were absolutely key to the mystery. I can't remember what they were supposed to mean or signify or what was going on. So yeah. If you start being spontaneous, start taking notes. Uh, so uh, Christoph asks, I'd love to hear about how you come up uh, with clues. Uh, so uh, Kat, where do clues come from? Muted. Um, where do clues come from? Well, when a mommy clue and a daddy clue love each other very much. Um, no, sorry, I had to say that you understand. Um, so where clues come from, uh, for me, is largely from the player's abilities, right? So, and also kind of in, in concert with that, from what the characters are going to do in the adventure. So for example, if you're playing in a dungeon crawl and the characters are going to be exploring and they're going to be hitting things with axes, um, then you need to put clues into places that you can hit with an ax, right? Whereas if you're playing a much more um, interrogative game where there's a lot more talking, then you want to put clues into NPCs that they can have conversations with. So I think that the 
the abilities that the players choose and the situations that they will be in and the actions that they'll take in those situations determine where you where you put clues that the, those characters can find in those situations. Yeah, I would say that the clues arise first of all from your not from the backstory, the, the antecedent action of whatever bad or weird thing has happened that the uh, players must then figure out, and then the next question on top of that is how do the players get to that information using their characters? And as Kat said, it's on their character sheet. And so uh, over the course of a scenario, I will try to balance uh, things so that, well, uh, can I have a science-y thing in this scene that will lead uh, uh, to another uh, scene so the person with the, the science-y abilities gets to do something? Uh, uh, or, you know, here's one where uh, the academic, you know, uh, our, our, our architecture seems to apply here. Let's find a way to get the architecture ability in. And most importantly, with the interpersonal abilities, the different ways of approaching people and getting information out of them. I try to vary those out over the course of a scenario because that then means that they'll be encountering a variety of different people and each person, the intimidating character will have someone to lean on, the reassuring character will have someone to uh, reassure and, uh, and so forth. Um, so the next question is, uh, we have someone who is familiar with Cthulhu Confidential and wants to know how uh, Gumshi with uh, multiple players works and how different it is from uh, from one to one. So this is a refreshing reversal of the uh, question we usually get, which is how is one to one different than a regular Gumshu? Uh, Gar, uh, what's, uh, what's uh, the big non-obvious difference other than you're running for a, a group of uh, players rather than a single player. Basically, you've got like, you know, five people speculating about what's going on, five people pulling in different directions, and also often, you know, like your know, players chasing down multiple leads at the same time, so it's like switch between two sets of players, so there's more of a sort of a spotlight time uh, balancing issue. I mean, the actual mystery normally doesn't change too much depending on how many players you have. Um, it's still basically following the same chain of clues and working out what's going on. It's just how the mystery is played through feels different. Uh, Kat, uh, how else uh, does uh, multi uh, differ from uh, solo? Um, yeah, so I think that the one of the key things for me is the intensity of it um, and the spot. Yeah, I mentioned before about spotlight, balancing the spotlight. A thing that you don't think about is that when you move from, so when, you, when you're when you in one-to-one -one play, you cover a lot of territory really, really quickly. You get through a lot of material because you don't have, as Gar was saying, the you know five or six people at the table all kind of talking about what they're going to do next or whatever. So you get through a lot less material um, in a multiplayer gumshoe game versus in a single player gumshoe game. Um, but it's also a lot less intense for everyone. Um, the spotlight is shared between however many players you have with the GM. So it's not, it, it isn't the same, the focus is on the GM or the focus is on the player. The focus is spread around the table. So it's not, I, I think that maybe more, um, less kind of talkative players might find it more comfortable because they're sharing the spotlight a lot more with people. They're not, there isn't the same demand on the players to to input um, material into the the game session um, to the same extent, and it's the same for the GM as well. It's a much less, I think, I think it's a much lighter cognitive load for the GM as well because they're not they have a lot more thinking room, they have a lot more planning room, and they have a lot more input as well. So like. Um, we were talking about kind of improvising adventures. So it gives you a lot more cool ideas to, to potentially draw from and integrate into your game. Uh, the next question, uh, we've talked about uh, nudging a bit, but uh, but what if your players are just totally stuck? What, what technique do you uh, use to uh, pry them loose from their uh, uh, sticking point, Ken? Um, I think one of the really, you know, sort of, underrated because it seems so obvious and simple methods is to just under the guise of asking them what they're going to do next, provide a recap of the things they ought to be doing. So you can say, all right, uh, we've got a lot of information here. I just need to know so I can prep the next scene. Are you going to go uh, talk to the butler? 
Are you going to uh, examine the grounds? Or are you going to um, uh, hang around with Inspector Havisham and uh, see if he lets something slip? And they have thought, oh, that's right. We've never talked to the butler. And then they'll go off and talk to the butler because that's literally the obvious choice that they didn't make. So just under the guise of, of recapping, you can often um, uh, provide them with a relatively subtle nudge forward. Again, once you know your players and your players know you, they'll know what's happening, but they'll be too embarrassed to call you on it. <laughs> uh, but players get stuck when they think there are no options. So as Ken said, r remind them of, of their options. And uh, sometimes they've talked themselves out of things that you need them to do in this scenario because those are too dangerous. And then you sort of have to give them a pep talk of, you know, uh, often people will think about, well, in a, the security guards in the real world would never let us into this place. It's like, well, A, actually they probably might, and, and B, uh, this is a, a genre of work where you're a, a, a skilled uh, ninja-like infiltration expert, or you can rely on your uh, fast talk to get past them, that you r remind them that, that their characters uh, are uh, much more capable in this situation than they personally uh, would be. Um, the next question is, have you ever needed to retcon a part of your investigator's investigation due to some miscommunication from either you or them? And if you have or haven't, what advice could you give us to make that situation feel as little retconish as possible so as not to break the pace of a section, uh, session? Just asking, as that happened in my Dracula dossier gaming group last week. Uh, uh, Gar, what happens when you have to rewind a bit and re-explain re things and how do you make that feel smooth? Well, the first thing I sort of ask myself is, is there a way to sort of fix this without having to retcon? Can I, like, you know, go, oh, like, you know, most vampires can't enter sunlight, but this guy's special because he has some amulet or something. Often that's not possible without breaking the mystery. Um, so there I would sort of go, I, I'd probably just sort of fess up and go, lads, um, when I said that, like, you know, there were six people in the room. I forgot to count this guy. There was actually a seventh person there. Um, we'll like, you know, assume that you have took their contact details and you can track them down. And it was the butler. And you, you talk to them whenever you want. Um, I mean, mistakes happen in, in, in play. And because mysteries are often this like, you know, very, very carefully curated and arranged set of information. And if one piece of that goes awry, then things can break down. It's probably just to be honest with the players and say, I misspoke. I <laughs> I overlooked this bit, um, and making make as few changes as possible. But retcon if you must. Uh, so next question is: uh, How do you best keep players on the trail of a multi-session mi mystery if they're not great uh, note takers and they forget clues? Uh, uh, Ken, how would you manage that? I mean, a lot of it is just in the recap. I mean, what what we do in in my ongoing games, if they're doing an ongoing mystery, is uh, we try and either start the session last time uh, previously on, and then I'll sort of rattle off the things that seem to be the salient things forward. Or uh, sometimes at the end of the session, um, we'll stop just a little early and I'll say, now write down, and I'll tell them to write down, uh, your character's uh, plans for next session. And, and presenting it again as not you're stupid, but as help me prep those scenes because I'm the poor GM. I'm just so overburdened and incompetent. I need your help. And so they'll they'll say, oh, we're going to do this, this, and this. And then they've written it down. And so they can they've kept notes against their will. Mm -hmm. uh, so those 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 two techniques, I mean either someone has to remember or else you're running some sort of weird uh, amnesiac, you know, Jason Bourne Mysteries adventure. But uh by and large, it's easy enough, especially now that people have uh imbibed uh, Slack um, uh, 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 basic cable t uh, storytelling to do a previously on, feed them the big bits and, and go forward, right? Uh, and uh, the next question is, what should I be thinking about when I'm running a long running mystery? Uh, what if the mystery is season long or uh, campaign long? And I would uh, suggest breaking that up into, as Ken suggests, uh, episodes, different mysteries that have discrete answers into which you drop other questions that you can then pick up later, because otherwise it just becomes a massive memory problem that is uh, too hard. So always have a, a, an immediate mystery and then possibly some uh, wider mysteries on top of that. Next question is, uh, 
can you give examples of a, a module uh, or scenario written in each of the two styles? So in Ocean of Clues versus Maze of Clues, uh, Kat? So I know that, um, I think the Dracula dossier is probably the best example um, of the Ocean of Clues. I think that's that's really where Ken has kind of taken the Ocean of Clues concept and just um, explore, explored it to its fullest capacity. Um, but for a maybe more manageable um, Ocean of Clues collection, I'd look at something like the Armitage Files, um, which is, again, a kind of an Ocean of Clues style campaign, but it's um, it's a lot. It, it doesn't require quite as much um, improvisational um, input from the GM. Um, and then, in terms of the maze of clue style, I mean, I think that the majority of our gumshoe um, adventures are written in the more uh, maze of clue style. So they're they're more kind of formulaic. They're more you follow the clues through to the. Um, to their standard um, outcome. So anything like um, Trail of Cthulhu adventure collections, like the Mythos expeditions, or um, Stunning Eldritch Tales, um, Gar's um, Arkham Detective Tales, they're all kind of more the, the maze of clues style of, of uh, play, or of adventure structure rather. Uh, so this question is also for Kat because it's one of my favorite style of questions, which is a request for a product in the form of a question. Is there enough of an audience for a Pelgrane Investigator Adventure Creation Guide above and beyond the parts included in the core uh, game book? And uh, Ethan Schoonover would also like that. Right. So, so say that again. It's a uh, so so for... a, a a a guide to creating adventures that is a standalone thing that is not tied to the GM advice in the different core books. Hmm. I well, uh, you tell us. I mean, if if you know people get on social media or if they get in the chat or whatever, and if enough people are also on our Discord, I'm I'm pretty active on there. So like, get in there and just start badgering us. And if enough people badger us, you know, eventually we'll have to listen. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't think we'll have to listen. <laughs> We may listen. We yeah. may listen. Um, I think. I think it's a. I think it's a really great idea. Um, so it would very much be up to my co-panelists as to whether they felt they had enough advice and information to to put into that, um, to actually make a book of it. But certainly for something like a digital product, yeah, I could see that being a thing. Some sort of gumshoe compendium, perhaps. <laughs> uh, let's move on to the next question. Uh, how would you deal with the players solving the mystery early while you still have two hours left in the session? Ken, uh, that's uh, as far as I'm concerned. That's a that's great. That's a bonus. I mean, unless you're even if you're running a con game and people have sort of this this is uh, we're renting the table from you, monkey. Now perform. Um, I mean, if if you're at a con and you desperately just need to vamp for time, prolong the last fight. You know, have the villain. Oh, he, 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 sure, it just looked like the parlor maid, but it's actually a shape shifting dragon, and then we have a big fight uh, to deal with. And that, you know, fights always eat up time. At, at the table, uh, in your normal game session, you know, you're, you're, you're done. So now you can explore consequences, which is something you never get to do at table. So, yeah, you've, you've solved the mystery. You've confronted the parlor maid slash dragon. They've been arrested and taken off. Now, um, you maybe you have a grateful uh, uh, prime suspect who wants to do you a favor, and you can decide what that favor will be going forward in the campaign or... Inspector Havisham has come to trust and believe you. And he says, well, you guys were so useful in this mysterious dragon case. Maybe you can help us with those arsons down on the riverfront and launch you back into the next session. You can you can use that opportunity to tie this story into an ongoing campaign or into the player character's reality in a way that you normally don't get the option to at the end of a session because you're always on the run to the next session. This is, this is an opportunity to deepen your campaign world and should uh, be treasured, not squandered. Uh, so the uh, next question is, uh, how do you uh, help players not get overwhelmed by information? Uh, Kat? Mm, I, I think that's a good question. Um, as somebody who, who can often get overwhelmed, like get uh, decision paralysis if there's too many options. Um, I think what we were saying earlier about taking notes and about recapping and reminding the players what the important things were, what they had focused on previously, um, what their bullet pointed list of things to do next was. Um, 
and also allowing them a little, and this is particularly important if you're running a one-to-one game, allowing them a little bit of space to just chat it out. You don't want them sitting there just talking about the, the mystery and not actually going out and solving the mystery, but you do need to give them some space to process and, and to go through the clues. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so we have a question for a recommendation uh, for the best written mystery uh, scenario. Uh, uh, Ken, I think you have an answer for that. Yeah, the uh, incontrovertibly correct answer is uh, The Night I Died, written by Robin D. Laws. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's Canadian, and so he doesn't get out much. Um, it's in uh, the uh, Shadows Over Filmland collection, which is our Trail of Cthulhu uh, scenarios told in the style and against the backdrop of universal horror pictures. And this is Robin's tribute rather to the RKO horror tradition of Val Luton. And it's a great atmospheric piece. The writing is sublime. The characters are all very real in a very limited space. And it has just a lot of fun, creepy uh, twists and atmosphere. I mean, if, you, if you're looking for something that's everything you want to see in, a, in an adventure like that in, the, in a very narrow, constrained space, Night I Died is absolutely, I don't want to say non real because Robin's written other things, but it's it's first water. Uh, the next question is, uh, 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 this is about premise rejection, I think. Uh, when running investigative type games, I've seen the tactic of donning a disguise and burning down damn near every building they exit come up way more often than I'd like. Uh, what are some ways of steering players away uh, from these improbable actions? And this uh, suggests the players are more interested in chaos agentry uh, than in uh, uh, solving the mystery. So you might want to give them a, a game in which it's about burning things down. Uh, another solution would be to give them something to burn down uh, early on. And I guess the question that you have to ask yourself is, are they burning stuff down because they don't have a better option? In which case you can run through the list of sensible things they could do as we have uh, suggested earlier. Uh, but if they really just want to blow things up all the time, they probably, want to run a, a different game. There may be a player uh, game a mismatch going on. Um, uh, the next question is, how would you run a mystery in the style of Mickey Spillane? Ken? Um, well, uh, <laughs> I would not run it with uh, people who are not already into the style of Mickey Spillane. That is not a style to spring on uh, uh, people who are remotely concerned about, oh, I don't know, gender roles or issues of police violence. <laughs> I would, um, uh, you know, so let us presume that you have a table of, of, of Neanderthals or um, uh, incredibly deracinated genre fans, whichever it is. And I would say, um, it, it obviously it works best on a one-to-one -one because Mickey Spillane is, uh, his, Mike Hammer is classically a lone hero who can trust nobody and hates everybody, including himself. Uh, and just constant fist fights. Uh, it's almost a, a, a dungeon crawl in that way, because the things that reveal clues are physical violence. Uh, Knights Black Agents is sort of written uh, in that with the sort of Euro-style sheen of, of a spy thriller. But again, uh, the, you use that that uh, wheel, um, uh, uh, by surviving danger, you get information which always points you into more danger. That's the Mickey Spillane wheel, and it's also the, um, uh, th the thriller wheel, uh, as, as in things like, you know, the Bourne trilogy. So... Uh, constant fist fights, um, uh, the, the characters or character uh, should uh, be uh, uh, given um, uh, easily conquered uh, targets in the sense of either people that they can beat up and get information out of or otherwise impose their personality on and get information out of, but that information should only open them to retribution from the actual criminal forces. It should never allow them a moment's uh, sort of... Uh, a piece either existentially or narratively. Uh, so uh, next question is uh, tips for managing player lack of familiar knowledge. So they don't live in the 1930s. There's many things that would be uh, immediately apparent to people who uh, live in a particular time or, or place, whether it's a fantasy setting or sci-fi future. So how do you handle uh, in an investigative scenario the gulf between uh, uh, characters who know their world much better than the players do. How do you c convey that information to them? Uh, Gar? This is like, you know, as a expert in like, you know, xenobiology or like, you know, as a long-term resident of Richard's Cleveland, you, A, like, you know, know the things, but also point out like, you know, 
when things are out of place, like, you know, um, that wouldn't be obvious to the player. So, like, you know, you, your scans detect a silicon-based life form. That's perfectly normal. You've encountered these things before. It's That's, like, you know, not a major thing. Versus you detect an argon-based life form. You know that the Space Federation has never encountered such a creature before. Um, this is, like, you know, first come to the whole new form of life. As you point out to the player when something is basically relevant and alar- alarming or, or fascinating to their character as opposed to letting the players sort of work out for themselves or try and piece it together. Uh, and uh, uh, we're, uh, we're hitting the hour mark, even when you take our uh, uh, somewhat uh, late start into account. So we're just gonna wrap up with uh, two more questions. Uh, this one I think is uh, a, a question for pretty much any tabletop role playing game. Uh, so Kat, how do you keep the players playing the game rather than talking about the game? Um, I, I mean, so I think that there are a couple of answers to that. Like the first is um, there's a new concept. Well, I say new, it's new to me. Um, the concept of the session zero, where you all kind of get together and you align your expectations. You know, you kind of talk about what it is you're you're hoping to get out of the, the game, particularly if it's a campaign you know, so you kind of discover if your players just want to go around the place punching people or if they want to talk to people or, you know, the, the type of game, you know, the themes and the tones and and also, you know, if there are any uh, topics that people would prefer that you didn't have in the game. You can establish all of that um, in the session zero. So then once you know that you're going into the game all aligned and you're all interested in the same kind of play, um, I think that then it's it's a matter of engagement, right? So you need to kind of build in rewards through the narrative, right? To kind of keep people, to keep players engaged. So for example, this I think this is particularly important if you're playing in a long-term campaign, you need to have, like Robin was saying earlier, you need to have um, dramatic arcs, like mini arcs that come to resolution within that. So the players have to feel like they're moving forward, like they're making progress, but also like their, their actions have consequences consequences in the game and meaning in the game. I think that players tend to disengage when they feel, like Robin said, that they don't have any options, right? So you need to make sure that they have options and that they they can see that they as players are empowered to make decisions within that game that then have consequences and impact the direction that the game goes and that they will be rewarded, that the game will reward them for taking risks and for acquiring information rather than uh, just sitting back and, and possibly not, not investigating. Uh, so the last question that we're going to have uh, time for in this master class uh, is uh, about uh, improvising clues. I'm currently running Dracula dossier and I have some trouble improvising clues during an investigation. Do you have any tips on inventing them uh, on the fly? Gar? Um, look at your player's investigative abilities, um, have your like, character matrix say, and basically look at them, see if, see if that sparks anything, especially if you can find an ability that hasn't been used in a while, or okay, throw something at a player that hasn't had a moment of spotlight in a while. I mean, you basically, you're just looking for basically inspiration and plausibility. Um, so do lots of background reading and research before the game. So you're sort of like, you know, primed to think of clues that could be derived from bureaucracy, you know, like MS bureaucracy or traffic analysis, or whatever, and also to your players' abilities and see if that sparks anything. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's very, very situational. Lots and of uh, Ken, uh, uh, inventing clues on the fly? Uh, a lot of it is just going to be, you know, like I say, it, if you have an idea of what the the crime is or the or the the enigma, and the player is using a given ability, you should be able to draw a line from that ability to the enigma and think what is the most logical thing that could happen. And it might even be something as tired as a footprint or a fingerprint or a trail of slime. And if but the the point that we were talking about at the very beginning of the of the segment of the of the panel rather is. Players inside a mystery aren't the same as readers of a mystery or watchers of a mystery. So if you give them even something that seems super hackneyed and obvious, it's in the moment, it's a revel- it's a revelation and it's a it's a blessing. 
because, oh, thank God we have a footprint. Now we can move forward on this. So if you've got something clever that you've gotten either by reading a lot of mystery fiction or um, uh, just uh, having a, a weird off-kilter brain, however it works, uh, that's great. Uh, feel free to come up with something cool and recondite, but something literally as simple as an eyewitness that says, I don't know, it was a tall woman. I think she had red hair. That will actually help. That is not a bad clue. That is a great clue because it does the job of a clue, which is move things forward. Uh, well, on the word uh, move things forward, I think uh, we will uh, move forward through online Gen Con by uh, thanking uh, everyone who uh, came to attend uh, this in its uh, streamed form. Uh, this will appear uh, later on uh, uh as a Twitch archive and then eventually on YouTube as well, if you want to uh, check back and review something that was said. Um, so at this point, uh, we're just going to uh, all uh, tell you where uh, you can find us online. Uh, and so uh, uh, can, where can people find you and where can they find Pelgrane Press? Um, so people can find me on Twitter. I'm at KatTHM. And people can also find Pelgrane on Twitter at Pelgrane Press, and then our website, pelgranepress.com, is that's got our web store. It's got all of the information you need about Gumshoe and also about each of the individual Gumshoe games that we were talking about today. And uh, if you're interested in picking up a bunch of investigative games, is there a, a convention deal on, even though we are online? <laughs> um, why yes Robin funny you should mention that there, <laughs> there, there is in fact um, a special Gen Con offer which is if you buy any four products from our web store you get the cheapest one for free so it's basically a four books for three offer and all of our books that if you buy them directly from us they all come with the PDFs bundled in with them for free uh, Gar where can people find you online uh, I'm on Twitter at Bithulder and probably easier to spell, he is garhanrahan.com, which has a occasionally updated blog, but more importantly, a Twitter account. Uh, Ken, where can people find you? Uh, I'm on the Facebook as at Kenneth as Kenneth Height, and I'm on the Twitters at Kenneth Height. So uh, one of those two places I will probably have popped in uh, either to plug something or to uh, you know say whatever's on my febrile little mind at the time. Uh, you can find the weekly podcast that Ken and I do together, Ken and Robin Talk About Stuff, by uh, searching for it in your podcast app of choice or at kenandrobintalkaboutstuff.com, or you can check out our Patreon for that. Uh, you can find me at Robin D. Laws on Twitter. So once again, thanks for everybody, and I hope you solve your latest mysteries.